So friends, it's being reported that Mark Meadows, Donald Trump's former chief of staff, was granted immunity and compelled to testify in the grand jury about the crimes of his former boss, Donald Trump. What does this immunity development really mean for the prospect of accountability? Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, we just learned that the person who is perhaps the single most important witness against Donald Trump in his federal cases, in his federal prosecutions, Mark Meadows, was apparently given some form of immunity to testify before the federal grand jury about Donald Trump's crimes. But before we celebrate this development, you know, it ain't all lollipops and rainbows, friends. So let's start with the new reporting, and then we're going to do a quick Team Justice Law School class on the ins and outs, the pros and cons of granting immunity to a really important witness, a guy like Mark Meadows. Here is the new reporting from ABC News. Headline, ex-chief of staff Mark Meadows granted immunity, tells special counsel he warned Trump about 2020 claims. And that article begins, former President Donald Trump's final chief of staff in the White House, Mark Meadows, has spoken with special counsel Jack Smith's team at least three times this year, including once before a federal grand jury which came only after Smith granted Meadows immunity to testify under oath, according to sources familiar with the matter. The sources said Meadows informed Smith's team that he repeatedly told Trump in the weeks after the 2020 presidential election that the allegations of significant voting fraud coming to them were baseless. A striking break from Trump's prolific rhetoric regarding the election. According to the sources, Meadows also told the federal investigators Trump was being dishonest with the public when he first claimed to have won the election only hours after the polls closed on November 3, 2020, before final results were in. Quote, obviously we didn't win, close quote, a source quoted Meadows as telling Smith's team in hindsight. Trump himself has called Meadows, one of the former president's closest and highest ranking aides in the White House, a special friend and a great chief of staff, as good as it gets. The descriptions of what Meadows allegedly told investigators shed further light on the evidence Smith's team has amassed as it prosecutes Trump for allegedly trying to unlawfully retain power and spread lies about the 2020 election. The descriptions also expose how far Trump loyalists like Meadows have gone to support and defend Trump. Meadows privately told Smith's investigators that to this day, he has yet to see any evidence of fraud that would have kept now President Joe Biden from the White House. And he told them he agrees with a government assessment at the time that the 2020 presidential election was the most secure election in U.S. history. Under the immunity order from Smith's team, the information Meadows provided to the grand jury earlier this year can't be used against him in a federal prosecution. That immunity came after a lawyer for Meadows requested that his client be immunized to testify before the grand jury, sources familiar with the matter said. A senior Justice Department official signed off on the request and an immunity order was then issued by U.S. District Court Judge James Boesberg, the chief judge at the federal court in Washington, D.C., days before Meadow, Meadows appeared before the grand jury in March, sources said. Had Meadows not been granted immunity, prosecutors expected him to invoke his Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination, sources said. 
Okay, friends, how about we knock out a quick Team Justice Law School class on immunity? And there's a lot to unpack here, but I'm gonna try to break it down to its basics. When I hear people talking about Mark Meadows, you know, struck an immunity deal, an immunity agreement, or worse, that because Mark Meadows has immunity, that means he's flipped on Donald Trump. Immunity is really not a deal, it's not an agreement, and it's not an indication that somebody has flipped. Here's why. When prosecutors want information that a person, whether that person is a, a witness or a potential suspect, maybe somebody who is complicit in the crimes of Donald Trump. When prosecutors want information and evidence that somebody has, somebody like Mark Meadows, there's basically three ways to go about extracting that evidence from a guy like Mark Meadows. One, you can subpoena him and order him to testify in the grand jury because a subpoena is a court order directing somebody to appear before the grand jury and testify. But that option wasn't available for Mark Meadows. Why? Because Mark Meadows has a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. He did a whole bunch of wrong, probably in combination with Donald Trump, maybe even in a conspiracy with Donald Trump. And because he could plead the Fifth, he could invoke his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, Jack Smith couldn't just subpoena him and say, hey, Mark, go into the grand jury and tell them what you know about Donald Trump's crime. So that was not a feasible way to extract information or evidence from Mark Meadows. There's a second way you can do it. When the witness that you're dealing with, Mark Meadows, for example, has committed a bunch of crimes himself, let's assume that the evidence shows Mark Meadows committed crimes. Remember all those reports about Mark Meadows forever burning documents in his fireplace? I don't think he was doing that just to generate warmth. Sure feels nefarious. That is one of a hundred things we've seen reported that suggests Mark Meadows was up to no good, right? Engaged in nefarious conduct, probably committing crimes. We don't know it for a fact, but the reporting suggests Mark Meadows was involved in criminal activity. When we, we want to extract information and evidence out of a guy like Mark Meadows, if he had been involved in criminal activity, you know what we do? We indict them for their crimes. We negotiate a plea agreement with them. Maybe we reduce the charges they have to plead guilty to. Maybe we put a sentencing cap on how much time we will seek for the crimes to which they're pleading guilty. There are all kinds of creative plea agreements you can enter into, you know, when it comes to somebody like Mark Meadows. And part of the plea agreement is, if you plead guilty, accept responsibility for your crimes and testify truthfully about the crimes of others, you will get a benefit, maybe a significant benefit for that bargain. That is the ideal way to extract incriminating evidence from a guy like Mark Meadows. Make him plead guilty and accept responsibility for his own crimes. Strike an agreement with him whereby he will testify truthfully about the crimes of others. And then you get the information. Then you can put him in the grand jury because he has the protection of that plea agreement. The reason that is the preferred method is because the witness, the person, is taking responsibility for their own crimes and being held accountable for the crimes they committed before you're asking a jury to believe that person when they testify about the crimes of others. Here is the least preferred method for extracting information or evidence from a guy like Mark Meadows. Grant him immunity. Why? Because immunity is a pass. Immunity is an agreement that nothing you say in the grand jury about what you did or about the crimes of others can be used against you. So there are different kinds of immunity and I'll talk a little bit about the difference between 
use immunity and transactional immunity toward the end. We don't know what kind of immunity Mark Meadows got, but what we do know based on the reporting, assuming it's accurate, is that he got some kind of immunity and he was then allowed to go into the grand jury and testify, presumably about crimes committed by Donald Trump, and he has not taken responsibility for his own crimes. He has not pleaded guilty. He has not entered into a cooperation agreement with Jack Smith to testify at the, the, the trials of others, Donald Trump or anybody else. The reason that is the least preferred method to extract information from somebody is because they are not made to, to take responsibility for their own crimes. Frankly, that's, le that's morally dubious. It's kind of legally dubious. If a guy like Mark Meadows, chief of staff to the president of the United States, was complicit in some of Donald Trump's democracy-busting crimes, don't we as a society want to see him held accountable for them? Don't we as a society want to see him take responsibility for them? The problem is if you grant somebody immunity and they never have to take responsibility for their own criminal conduct, it becomes very difficult to put them on the witness stand at a future trial of Donald Trump, for example, and say to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, okay, Mark Meadows got a completely free pass for all the democracy busting crimes he committed together with Donald Trump, but ladies and gentlemen, just believe everything he says about what Donald Trump did. You know, I have seen immunity break bad or not play particularly well if a jury knows that this person didn't have to take responsibility for their own crimes. There's an argument that, well, this person is going to say whatever the prosecutors want him or her to say because they are enjoying a complete free pass for their crimes. It is not the best way to set up a witness to be successful as a trial witness, to be believed, to be credible. So that's why I say as a prosecutor, as a former career prosecutor, immunity is my least favorite way to extract evidence from a witness. Sometimes it's necessary. Let's talk about how Jack Smith may have decided, and we don't know, and I give him great credit for making tactically smart choices here, um, but we don't know precisely what led him to immunize Mark Meadows and put him before the grand jury. There is um, some reporting that Mark Meadows' lawyer, a gentleman named Terwillig Terwilliger, who was a longtime DOJ official who knows what he's doing, uh, negotiated some kind of limited immunity. So it may be that there was a negotiated immunity um, that provided that maybe Mark Meadows just has to go in and answer 10 questions about the things Donald Trump said and did at a particular time, and that's it. And that is the limit of the immunity that was granted to Mark Meadows. That would at least preserve the ability in the future for Jack Smith and his federal prosecutors to charge Mark Meadows with his crimes. Here's why granting somebody immunity gets very dicey. Remember Oliver North during the Iran-Contra affair? He committed all kinds of crimes. He was indicted, went to trial, and was convicted. But Congress had granted him immunity and compelled him to testify. And, and Oliver North's conviction got busted on appeal got reversed on appeal because once you immunize somebody, the prosecutors have to prove that nothing that person said under that grant of immunity ever worked its way back to being used against the witness who was immunized in the event that person was prosecuted after being granted immunity and testifying. So granting immunity can make it much more difficult for prosecutors ever to charge that person in the future. Not impossible, but makes it more difficult. So let's finish up with a couple of other questions that have been bubbling up since the reporting 
about Mark Meadows getting some form of immunity, some level of immunity, and being compelled to testify before the grand jury. First of all, I mentioned there are two kinds of immunity. There's use immunity and there's transactional immunity. Use immunity means um, you can be compelled to testify and nothing you say can be used against you, but that immunity doesn't provide protection against prosecution. It's not saying you will never be prosecuted. It's simply saying you can be forced or compelled to testify and nothing you say, nothing you testify about can ever be used against you. Transactional immunity is the full enchilada. If you're granted transactional immunity, you can be compelled to testify, but you can never be prosecuted for anything pertaining to the, the scope of the immunized testimony or information. So I don't think Mark Meadows would have gotten transactional immunity. That's something that prosecutors don't often um, pursue. He probably got some form of limited use immunity. Another question that has been percolating is, well, what does this mean for Mark Meadows' Georgia State prosecution? And the answer is, it probably doesn't mean much of anything. Here's why I say that. The prosecutors, when they were pursuing immunity for Mark Meadows, um, technically it's called a compulsion order. What we do when we want to um, pursue immunity for a witness is there is an office at the Department of Justice. We fill out a lengthy application. I did this many times as a federal prosecutor. If it is approved, then we file a motion with the chief judge for federal district court in Washington, D.C. That's Judge Jeb Bosberg. And we seek a compulsion order. We ask the judge to issue an order compelling this person to testify and providing nothing the person says under the compulsion order can be used against him. That's limited use immunity. What does it mean for the Georgia State prosecution, where Mark Meadows is being prosecuted for a subset of the crimes that were committed in Washington, D.C., like the overarching effort to overturn the results of the presidential election? Um, I don't think it means much of anything because when Jack Smith would have acquired that federal use immunity in D.C., he would not be permitted, in my opinion and experience, to take Mark Meadows' testimony that Meadows gave in the grand jury under that limited use immunity and deliver it down to District Attorney Fonnie Willis and her prosecutors. Because then what would happen? Well, then it really would be used against Mark Meadows, albeit in a separate prosecution, a state court prosecution. And I think that would violate certainly the spirit of that immunity and that compulsion order, even if not the letter of it. Um, so I don't think that testimony that Mark Meadows gave under that compulsion order, that use immunity, will see the light of day anywhere else but in Jack Smith's case in whatever way it can be used moving forward. So I don't think this grant of immunity really means anything um, in connection with Fonnie Willis's prosecution, RICO prosecution, of Mark Meadows and others down in Georgia. Here's the other thing. Let's just assume the nightmare scenario where Mark Meadows committed crimes but got some level of immunity and he will never be prosecuted for his crimes for one reason or another. That doesn't feel right and I'm going to conclude with why it doesn't feel right in a minute. But Mark Meadows is a defendant in a RICO case in Georgia. So it doesn't mean he gets away with everything in the event he either pleads guilty and agrees to cooperate with the Georgia State prosecution or he goes to trial and is convicted and likely sentenced to prison if he's convicted on the lead count, the RICO count. Um, so there is a silver lining lurking behind this immunity development, even if the immunity development means it may be less likely, not off the table, but it may be less likely that Mark Meadows gets prosecuted federally in D.C. for what he did in connection with trying to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. And that silver lining lurking behind the big dark immunity cloud 
is District Attorney Willis's RICO prosecution of Mark Meadows down in Georgia. But let me come back to this fundamental point. When I saw the reporting about the immunity, um, it made me uncomfortable. It was disheartening because I know that it's just not the preferred way to go about um, getting the information from somebody who himself appears to have committed any number of democracy-busting crimes. And the reason it struck me as wrong is because as Chief of Staff to the President of the United States, Mark Meadows should have been protecting our nation. He should have been protecting the Constitution. He should have been protecting our democracy in every way he could, including against Donald Trump, as Trump went about committing these democracy-ending crimes to unlawfully keep himself in power. So yes, Mark Meadows should be held accountable, not only in Georgia, not only in a state court prosecution, but federally in Washington, D.C. Because justice matters. Friends, thank you for bearing with me during that long and hopefully not too rambling or confusing discussion about immunity. There are so many unanswered questions that there are a lot of different bases to touch on the immunity front to try to figure out what in the world might be going on with this grant of immunity for Mark Meadows. So thank you for bearing with me. And as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.